Cade was moving his shoulders left and right, shining his light on the tunnel walls, taking it all in as they walked further. I can't believe a tunnel system exists this far underground, Cade said. Yeah, don't you think it's a little strange they all had this equipment at the ready? Cade thought for a moment. It was a little odd that it was all there, almost like they were expecting to find an underground tunnel system underneath the earth's soil. Now that you mention it, it is a little odd. This here is some high-tech equipment that I believe is used for mining. Why have this stuff sitting around if you're just going to drill a hole into the ground? It doesn't make much sense. Maybe they knew, Ricardo said. Suddenly, the walkie-talkie crackled. Come in. Come in, Mr. Porter. Orwell was speaking in a semi-panicked voice. Cade raised the walkie-talkie up to his face and pressed down the button on the side. I hear you, Orwell. This is Cade. You won't believe what we found down here. I'm guessing you found a tunnel system. How'd you know that? Listen, I'll tell you all about my job in a little bit, but right now, you all need to get out of there. There's a lot of movement going on down there, and I'm reading there's a possibility of a collapse. You need to leave ASAP. Roger that, Cade said. Both Cade and Ricardo turned around and began running back to the cage. They'd walked half a mile into the tunnel, so it would take some time to get back. As their running commenced, they heard something coming over from the mouth of the tunnel. Yells of agony echoed off the tunnel's walls. Were they too late? Was there already a collapse? Then two figures became visible, running toward them. It was Mr. Porter and Steve. They came up to Cade and Ricardo and stopped, putting their hands on their knees and gasping for breath. Steve tried to speak, but the words wouldn't come out. They're... They're all... Mr. Porter tried to say. Hey, spit it out, Ricardo said, looking down the tunnel to see if he could see what they might have been running from. They're dead. They're all dead, Mr. Porter said in a panicked tone. What do you mean, they're all dead? Was there a cave-in? No. No, it... It was... Steve stammered. It was what? Cade said, losing his patience. We don't know what it was, Mr. Porter said, finally catching his breath. What do you mean you don't know what it was? Ricardo snapped. It's what I said it was, Mr. Porter snapped back. You didn't say what it was, Cade's words rushed out of his mouth. You'd have to have seen it to believe it, Mr. Porter said. Well, humor me. If it wasn't a cave-in, then what was it? Steve dropped to his knees and began to sob as he shook his head side to side. Mr. Porter, who finally caught his breath, stood up a little straighter than before. Cade noticed for the first time that Mr. Porter didn't have his rebreather on. Maybe throughout all the commotion, he didn't think to ask. He went to his suit pocket and took out his air meter. The air was now breathable. He took off his respirator and let it hang on his neck. Ricardo followed suit. I don't know. Cade cut the foreman off, grabbing his collar and pressing him against the tunnel wall. If it wasn't a cave-in, then what was it? It was calmly said, but the aggression was palpable between the two. Mr. Porter looked down and sniffed. (laughs) Fine. We'll go and find out ourselves. Cade started to march to the mouth of the tunnel when he realized Ricardo wasn't right behind him. Hey, you coming, man? I don't know, man. You see these two? Something freaked him out. Cade rolled his eyes and then stormed back to the three men. So breathe and tell me what happened, Cade said, eyeing Mr. Porter. Mr. Porter shuffled a bit, then took in a deep breath. Steve was still in shock. We couldn't find the drill bit. We concluded that something had torn it from the drill. We were waiting for further instructions as to whether or not to investigate the mines. When it happened. Mr. Porter rubbed his eyes. We were waiting around the cage when the side of the tunnel erupted. Rocks sprayed every which way. 
The rocks squashed some of the workers. They were either dead or unconscious. I don't know for sure. Then this... This thing emerged. Mr. Porter's hands began to shake. Cade could now see the red that soaked them. And when he stopped rubbing his eyes, his face was half smeared with the red stuff. Blood. This... This thing came towards the new kid and... And... The words weren't coming. He looked down at the blood on his hands and his eyes grew noticeably wetter. It swallowed the kid whole. I could hear his screams as he went down the thing's body. Blood covered the floor beneath it. Its insides were covered in blades and saws and... He began to shake again. I heard his screams. He sounded as if... He sounded as if he fell into a giant blunder. Cade's jaw hung open. Ricardo stepped forward as if about to say something, but then decided not to at the last second. It was like a mechanical centipede, Steve said. Everyone turned to Steve, who was slowly standing up from his kneeling position. Cade didn't want to believe what the two were suggesting, but the blood and the fact that they were the only people to come down this tunnel suggested their story might have been true. So everyone's dead but you two? Haven't you been listening? Mr. Porter spat out. R Ricky, what do you think we should do? Ricardo looked back and forth between the two of them. Then to Steve. I don't know, man. This is some deep shit we're in. Ricardo shifted. If that thing is still back there, shouldn't we be running? Then a mechanical screech echoed through the tunnels. It was like a cybernetic banshee was calling to them, its cries screaming to them as if to say, You're next. In unison, without saying a word to one another, they all began to run hard in the opposite direction toward the mouth of the tunnel. Mr. Porter and Steve followed behind Cade and Ricardo closely, but eventually fell behind. Cade looked back and saw what shook Mr. Porter and Steve. A mechanical worm-like creature with bending rods for legs and its pincers were made of some sort of metal. It matched the sides of the tunnels, suggesting that it may have been the original thing that created them. Steve fell back from Mr. Porter and out of breath due to his asthma. The thing's pincers pierced Steve's side and retracted quickly, causing Steve to fall to the ground. The pincers grabbed him and forced him deep into its mouth. Steve screamed. But just like Mr. Porter said before, a blender-like noise came from the beast, and Steve's screams became garbled and stopped soon after that. Cade cursed and focused in front of him. He no longer wanted to look at the scene taking place behind him. The screech occurred again, followed by a shake in the tunnels as what sounded like a blast came from behind them. Cade looked back and realized that the thing was gone. Cade, we gotta keep moving, Ricardo yelled. Cade didn't realize that he'd stopped moving. He was concentrating on the huge hole in the ground just behind him. The thing dug downwards, but why? Cade bent down to feel the dirt rumbling underneath him, and suddenly realized what was happening. Ricky! Ricardo stopped and looked back, and just behind him, the thing lunged out of the ground. Ricardo turned back around and stumbled backward. He began to shuffle back, but it was too late. The thing's pincers pierced his calf and shin bone, causing Ricardo to scream out in pain. The pincers dragged him closer to its mouth, retracted, and pierced Ricardo once again. This time through both sides of his ribcage, lifting his body over its mouth. Its humming became louder than before, as if the blender were roaring into action. Ricardo gurgled out blood and extended a hand to Cade. Help me, buddy, were Ricardo's last words, as the pincers retracted 
and he fell into the thing's mouth. Ricardo screamed, but his scream quickly became muffled, and then fell silent. Mr. Porter already started running the opposite way. Cade fell to his knees, looking out into nothingness as he took in what had become of his best friend. He had lost another person close to him. The feeling of pain came back to him, one he was all too familiar with. Mr. Porter got to the hole where the thing had dug into the ground before. He took a few steps back to prepare his running start, then he ran and jumped. He was just short and began sliding down the hole into the ground. The thing drilled down and disappeared from Cade's view. Cade snapped out of his lost state and ran back to try to save Mr. Porter but stopped as his cries and screams echoed off the tunnel walls. It was too late for the foreman. Cade turned and ran. He came to the second hole the thing had made and jumped. He reached out and caught the edge with his arms. He hoisted himself up and made his way out of the hole. He got up and ran as fast as he could until he saw another mouth of the tunnel. He reached it and peered in. Cade couldn't believe what he was seeing. If he wasn't being chased by a mechanical man-eating centipede, he would take time to marvel at the find before him. It was a saucer-like ship. It looked like one from the old sci-fi films of alien crafts. UFOs were what they were called. He stepped closer to the ship and looked it over and over, taking it all in. How it had gotten down here was the biggest question. Rock didn't touch the ship. It was as if some sort of field around it prevented the rock from enveloping it. At the right side of the ship was a ramp that extended from the ship to the ground. The cybernetic banshee screech echoed off the walls, and Cade knew he had to hide inside the ship, or else he'd end up like his good friend Ricardo. He missed him. He didn't deserve to go out like that. He ran up the ramp and into the ship. As he entered through the hangar door and into the spacecraft, the ramp withdrew and the door slid down, closing it off from the tunnels. He was surprised to find that in a white room with control stations with white seats, a giant box-like monitor hung in the middle of the ship with English writing on it. It had a time on the screen and realized what he was in in that very moment. This was no spaceship. This was a time machine. The date was for a period so far back that the numbers he read made no sense to him. They must have gone so far into the past. Cade's mind went wild over the find he'd uncovered. He pressed a button that said fuel, the screen displaying how much fuel the ship had left. Next to it was another button that read F and SM. He clicked it, and an image of the mechanical centipede came onto the screen. The full name of the thing appeared on screen as well. It was a fuel and security machine. Cade began putting all the pieces together. There was another button that read Ask, and right beside it was a microphone. Cade approached the mic and hovered his hand over the button. He bent and pressed it. TC-216, what is your question? An angelic female voice came from the monitors above. Cade gulped. Um, my question is, what happened to the crew of this ship? Question cannot be verified. All crew members are deceased. Deceased? But how? Cade pressed the button again and cleared his throat. TC-216, what is your question? What is the ship's condition? Ship is functional. Fuel is at 13%. Critical damage to the F and SM. Cade pressed the button again. TC-216, what is your question? What's wrong with the F and SM? F and SM model 119 is malfunctioning. Kate thought for a second, 
The puzzle was almost complete. He hit the button once more. TC-216, what is your question? Did the F and SM Model 119 kill the crew members? The ship registered, then finally clicked and loaded up an answer. Confirmed. Cade ran his hand through his hair. Everything makes sense now. The time travelers went back in time. Their fuel and security system went haywire, and they were killed by the very thing that was supposed to protect them. That thing had been stuck down here, protecting the ship. Maybe it remained dormant, just staying down here for eternity, corroding slowly, but... Then we came down and reactivated its protection protocol. It's just protecting the ship. It's just doing its job. Just like how we were just doing our job. Like how Ricky was just doing his job. Poor Ricky. Cade sat down in one of the seats and began to think hard. He remembered the last thing his friend said to him. Arms stretched out, calling out to him. Help me, buddy. He closed his eyes tight, remembering the scene vividly. Help me, buddy. Blood flowed from his mouth. Help me, buddy. He yelled in a demonic voice. Cade put his hands to his head and yelled. He tried to think about something else, but that same scene replayed in his mind repeatedly. The help me buddy became deeper and deeper every time it was said. Then it stopped, and a new scene played in his head. Daddy, look what I can do. He was back in the car with his son. Daddy! Look what I can do, Daddy! His son was bouncing in the back in his little car seat. He was holding a teddy tightly to his chest with his right arm. Buddy, I can't look right now, I'm driving. Daddy, look! His son demanded, stretching out the last word, which was shaky due to all his bouncing. Cade looked at his son in the rearview mirror. His son was wiggling one of his front teeth. It was loose and soon ready to come out. He smiled. I'll have to sneak a dollar under his pillow in no time. Then he looked back to the road. The car was too close for him to react. He rammed the back of the car. The car seat wasn't properly in place and his son soared through the windshield. Cade's face slammed into the steering wheel. And that's when he snapped back to the present. Cade began to cry, but straightened up and hit the button. TC-216, what is your question? How much fuel do I need in order to make a trip to the past? Time must be evaluated. What is your intended time? May 3rd, the year 2020. May 3rd has a few days before the accident occurred, killing his son. Calculating. Calculating. You need 10% fuel to go back to May 3rd, the year 2020. Cade sniffed and hit the button again. TC216, what is your question? How much fuel do I need to go back 30 minutes ago? Calculating. Calculating. You need 5% to go back 30 minutes. Cade frowned. I can't save both of them, but who do I choose? Maybe I could go back, save my son, and when the time comes, I can go back to the site and save Ricky. He hit the button once more. TC-216, what is your question? Can you send me back in time? Calculating. Calculating. This can be done. When would you like to arrive? Cade thought for a moment. What time should I do first? He was terrified yet excited at the same time. He couldn't wait to see his son once more. Computer, send me back to May 3rd, year 2020. Calculating. Calculating. Time is set. Destination is set. 
Arrival in 30 seconds. Cade smiled gleefully, shaking his fists in the air. But then it slowly faded as a realization set in. Wait a minute. I didn't set a destination. Everything flashed to black. Then he saw red. Like the color you see when you put your finger over a flashlight. An explosion was heard. And when he blasted out of the top window of the time machine, he was thrown into the air. He made a hard impact on the ground and turned to the ship. One time machine sat normally. The one he came through was smashed diagonally into the other one. Fire engulfed the ship and the ground began to shake. Cade looked at his leg. His ankle was broken. And he probably had a few sprains all over his once capable body. Next to him were scattered bits of the walkie-talkie he had attached to his side. He cursed, got up and turned to the tunnel's mouth, and slowly began to walk. Cade's thoughts were all over the place. He didn't know what time he had traveled to, or if he had traveled anywhere to begin with. He decided that he'd find the elevator shaft and travel back to the surface. It had been a long day, and his bed was calling him. He walked about a mile, leaning against the wall to ease the pressure on his broken ankle. Then he froze, as he stared at a rocky dirt wall that blocked his path. He felt the wall. It was solid. He must have reached the end of the tunnel. Fear shot through him like a bullet. He felt himself searching for something and pulled out his walkie-talkie. Orwell, can you read me? Nothing but static went through the receiver. Orwell, are you there? Again, nothing but static. He fell to his knees in shock. The reason why he hadn't reached the cage and instead was met with a dirt wall was simple. The hole hadn't been drilled yet. It wouldn't be drilled for another eight years. He slowly pulled out his air meter from his pocket. The air was becoming less breathable by the minute. The field the ship created was fading. He would die from lack of oxygen. He fell to the ground and tears rolled down his pale face. He banged his fists into the dirt. It's not fair, he yelled, tears flowing down his reddened cheek. It's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. Then the familiar, gut-wrenching, banshee metallic screech again echoed off the tunnel's walls. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed that fantastic story by Nick Gray. If you did, I'm going to be sure to leave the link to the story in the description down below, so please go give the author some love. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit that like button, click subscribe, and the little bell so you can be notified when the next one pops up. And as always, my Darkness Militia, have a terrifying evening.